Good morning and good afternoon. Hello and welcome to the first ARIMA High C webinar. We're really excited to have you here today to share information on ARIMA High C technology and the downstream applications in chromatin confirmation and de novo genome assembly. My name is Jay Clark and I'm going to be your moderator today. A couple of housekeeping items. All attendees have been placed on mute. If you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A box below. We're going to answer these questions throughout the presentation and during the Q&A section following the presentation. If you do have a specific project to discuss afterwards, please feel free to reach out via arimagenomics.com. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Anthony Schmidt, Arima Genomics VP of R&D. A fun fact about Anthony is that we actually believe he holds the world record for the most high C experiments ever run. Uh, we're getting in touch with Guinness to see if they're going to add that as a category. But uh, if you think you have the record, let us know and we can fight it over. And with that, thank you, Anthony, for presenting and take it away. Thanks, Jay, for the introduction. Yeah, we, we really couldn't be happier here to um, have our first webinar on Arima High C technology. And what we're gonna focus on today is, is our uh, rapid and robust high C workflow, specifically for the applications in chromatin confirmation and genome assembly analysis. The agenda today for the webinar is uh, I'm going to spend about the first half of the webinar uh, going through an introduction um, to the 3D genome and high C technology in general. And then the second half of the webinar today is going to focus on ARIMA high C specifically. We're going to go through a pretty detailed view of the workflow. We're going to go through our philosophy to data analysis and some of the tools that are available for ARIMA high C data analysis. We have a couple uh, stories um, towards the end about ARIMA high C uh, performance. And we'll finish up with just a very quick little vignette on some of the emerging applications of the ARIMA high C technology. So this, in this introduction, I'm gonna break it down by some of the core concepts related to the 3D genome and some of the really interesting biology that, that lies there. Um, I'll talk generally about the HiC workflow, and then I will dive into some of the utilities of HiC technology as it pertains to epigenetics and gene regulation, as well as how it pertains to genome assembly and genome scaffolding. So I'm gonna to try to bounce back and forth between its application in gene regulation and genome scaffolding sort of throughout the talk, and I'll try to make it clear when I'm, when I'm uh, switching gears. And then I'll finish this section with some of the uh, challenges that have been faced by existing high C technologies that have sort of limited its adoption to the broader community. So I think a nice way to think about the 3D genome is in this hierarchical view that was uh, written by uh, a friend of mine from Bing, Bing Ren's lab, uh, David Gorkin. And if you were to take a top-down view of uh, the nucleus, what you would see is that chromosomes occupy distinct chromosomal territories. For example, one chromosome may be here in red and another in blue and another in white. <laughs> And they're sort of these uh, self-folding, self-interacting chromosome uh, territories. So that's one interesting sort of large-scale organizational feature. And if, if you zoom in on one chromosome, let's say the blue one, and you continue to zoom in, what you'll see are these uh, structures that sort of appear like beads on a string. And what I mean by that is there's these uh, megabase scale self-interacting chromatin domains uh, that have been called topologically associated domains or TADs. And those TADs tend to be separated by architectural proteins uh, such as CTCF at the, at the boundaries between one TAD and another TAD. And if you take a closer look at these TADs and you look at these loop structures, this is an even finer scale uh, chromatin organizational feature, and these individual loops tend to be mediated by other proteins such as cohesin and uh, mediator. And uh, some orthogonal evidence for these structures comes from um, microscopy studies. This is a case where uh, these uh, researchers painted chromosomes different colors, and what you see 
um, here is the presence of chromosome territories. Each different chromosome is its own color. You can see that these are organized into self self-interacting structures. Um, and the only time really a chromosome would interact with another chromosome during interphase is really at the at the periphery of the chromosome along its surface. But most of it is highly self-interactive. And that can be modeled here um, as a fractal globule. And if you were to take sort of a cross section through this model, you would see the same thing with uh, chromosomes occupying their own space. Regarding the concepts of topological domains, here's an example to sort of illustrate one of the one of the concepts is if you had a two megabase region of your genome laid out as a thread in a linear format, and you have positions A and B, what you would expect if the organization of the genome was entirely random was for this string to just fold up into one massive knot, where A and B might still be close together in three-dimensional space. But in fact, the concept of topological domains could highlight something like this, where A and B are actually distal in three-dimensional space because they live in two distinct topologically associated domains. Um, in fact, these are often represented as these sort of triangle structures just to indicate that one triangle is one topological domain and it's separated by a boundary and then you have another topological domain here. So in order to explain, I think, how high c captures that three-dimensional genome information, it's helpful to think of it in the context of a conventional next-generation sequencing sample prep. So in your typical uh, NGS prep, you start with cells and tissues, and you end up with Illumina libraries. So here's your cell, and as we all know, you extract your DNA and you fragment that DNA to get it to a size appropriate for Illumina sequencing, you ligate adapters, you may do PCR amplification, and then you sequence with Illumina. And this uh, method has proven extremely valuable for, for many, many applications such as whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing. But in step one, you lose this critical information of spatial proximity, right? So when you extract DNA in a conventional NGS prep, you actually don't retain any information that the blue piece of DNA and the gray piece of DNA were close in three-dimensional space. And not, not only is that critical to measure three-dimensional conformation, it, it's also critical to capture long-range genetic information, which we'll talk about a little bit today. So while a conventional NGS prep preserves sequence, a high c sample prep <coughs> preserves sequence and structure. So fundamentally, you're still starting with cells and tissues, and you're ending up with a Lumina library, but the DNA extraction process, which is high c is just a little bit different. In high c you begin with cells, and the first step is to cross-link those cells. And that basically freezes the, the genome organization in time. It's like taking a, a snapshot of it and it's holding it in place so that it is amenable to some downstream molecular biology reactions. So you begin with cross-linked DNA. That cross-linked DNA is then digested with a restriction enzyme here. Those ends are filled in with a biotinylated nucleotide and then they are ligated together. So what's really interesting about this is that gray and blue become ligated into one piece, where before they weren't actually joined in any way, they were just held together by a protein. So you've created this artificial fragment, and this lig ligation junction here is really the piece of DNA that captures that really unique information. And then you reverse the crosslinks, you get rid of the proteins, and then you purify your uh, DNA. Uh, similar to a, a conventional NGS prep, the high c uh, library prep is very, very similar. The only difference here to uh, point out is that, uh, like I said in the, in the previous step, it's this ligation junction <clears throat> that has the uh, gray sequence and the blue sequence. It's those molecules that capture that spatial proximity information. And, and, and those are the molecules that you ultimately want to sequence to obtain um, information about uh, whether blue or, or gray was spatially proximal in the in the 3D genome. 
So you use the biotin marker here to enrich for those ligation junctions and you leave the only blue and only gray pieces behind because those don't have three-dimensional information. Um, adapters are ligated, PCR amplified, and then sequenced using paradents, uh, just like in a conventional NGS prep. And of course, the molecules that get sequenced are chimeric, uh, a, a mixture of uh, gray and blue, whereas in an NGS prep, it's just all blue or all gray. In the conventional NGS prep, uh, these are short contiguous sequences, and in high C, these are uh, chimeric sequences, and the insert length is variable, and it really just depends on which, which sequences were close in three-dimensional space. And one interesting use case uh, for uh, high C technology is in epigenetics, and I want to just highlight a really interesting study um, that came out last year from the Cavalli lab uh, in, in France. And they were interested in understanding the mechanisms of neuronal differentiation from embryonic stem cells down a neuronal lineage through neural progenitor cells and in, into cortical neurons. And just a couple of examples of things that they saw can be highlighted here. So. In, in ES uh, cells, in embryonic stem cells, um, they see the presence of uh, topological domains, which, which would be expected. And in this particular example, they have done high c RNA-seq, and CHIP-seq on in vitro differentiated cells, as well as cells that are extracted from uh, mice. So they see the presence of topological domains. And in, in this example, I'm just highlighting that there is a inactive neuronal specific uh, gene in this topological domain. And one of the really interesting things that they see is as they differentiate into NPCs, this one larger topological domain starts to segment into two different domains and a boundary appears between those two uh, smaller domains with the neuronal specific gene right at that boundary. And the same thing is seen as you further differentiate into uh, cortical neurons. When you look at this in the context of uh, loops, as expected, uh, what is known about um, ES cells is that there's a lot of very, um, there are uh, loops that are mediated by uh, polycomb proteins, which is illustrated here in red. There's all these loop structures that are, that are uh, bound by uh, polycomb proteins. And one of the things that they found is as you differentiate, these polycomb mediated loops start to become, become disrupted. And what you see as you differentiate into NPCs is that a um, neuronal specific so-called master regulator transcription factor binds in unique places and mediates cell type specific loops that drive cell type specific gene expression. And the same thing is observed in cortical neurons, although uh, a different set of, of transcription factors um, is, is bound and uh, mediating those loops. So this is just a, a, a very nice case where it's, it's the integration of chromatin state data uh, obtained from ChIP-seq, transcriptome data from RNA-seq, and chromatin confirmation data from, from high c And it's the, the integration of those data sets that really helps you understand the, the gene regulatory mechanisms during uh, differentiation. Another really interesting example that uh, was just published this past year from the, from the Phillips Kremens lab at Penn is that they were interested in understanding the mechanistic basis of disease involving repeat expansions, uh, such as in fragile X syndrome um, and, and other diseases, and they focus on, on fragile X. <clears throat> so what I'm showing here is the FMR, FMR1 gene that uh, is, is implicated in fragile X, and in healthy individuals, this gene is expressed. This is sort of the topological structure. You see TADS uh, right here, um, around FMR1 and another TAD uh, over here um, around FMR1. And these architectural proteins, blue here, CTCF. And um, what they saw was that in patients that uh, had fragile X syndrome, you see expansion within the FMR1 gene of that repeat. You see the uh, disappearance of the CTCF binding site right around that gene. And now what's happened is that the FMR1 gene, which used to be constrained right here within this TAD near the boundary, is now actually part of the other topological domain. So it's sort of shifted into a different structural 
uh, framework, perhaps a different regulatory environment, and that gene now becomes not expressed. So, you know, I think this also highlights a really interesting case where uh, the chromatin confirmation data lets one view the molecular mechanisms of disease through a new window, where otherwise you wouldn't have seen this, this uh, topology or these mechanisms without uh, high C. I think these are just you know, very nice cases of development and disease. Uh, the same sort of applies for cancer, limb, limb malformations and other diseases, uh, response to stimuli and defining cell types from heterogeneous samples uh, among other applications. So now I wanna switch gears uh, completely and, and talk about HI-C's utility in genome assembly. Now this is the same uh, high C data, just purposed for an entirely different application, right? So I think just uh, just assuming that the goal of a genome assembly is really to obtain the most comprehensive and contiguous and accurate genome assembly that then enables you uh, to to do further exploration of the genetic and molecular underpinnings of a given species. And the role that HI-C plays in this process um, is in actually constructing that comprehensive, contiguous, and accurate genome assembly. And I want to just sort of bring the focus back to something that I, I introduced at the beginning, is that's this concept of chromosome uh, territories, because this plays really a fundamental part in how HI-C is useful in uh, genome assembly. So I said that these chromosomes are, are organized into, into territories, like I showed here, and that HI-C captures lots of that spatially proximal information. So lots of the spatially proximal information that's captured by HI-C tends to be within a chromosome and very, very little uh, spatially proximal information just at the, at the surface of chromosomes that would be between different chromosomes. So lots of the data is coming from within a chromosome. So let's take this example where you have generated uh, contigs, whether it's by uh, PacBio or, or Oxford Nanopore. And this is your starting point, and you really don't know uh, where these contigs belong uh, in the genome. You don't know what uh, chromosome that they belong to. You just know the sequence of these contigs. And because HI-C uh, captures links between two different regions of the genome, and those regions tend to be from the same chromosome, you can sequence into a HI-C library, and figuratively, you start to link contigs together like this, and as you continue to sequence and view, view uh, more, more high C reads, you begin to build more and more links, like this, and like this, until finally you're at a point where you can begin to partition the contigs into distinct chromosomes like this based on the high C reads that support the links between those contigs. So now if we just focus on uh, one of these sets of contigs, for this purpose, let's just define it as a chromosome in, in blue. The, the next step of the process is to order and orient the contigs along a chromosome. And this process leverages another feature of the high c data, which is illustrated here on the left. So what I'm plotting here on the left is an, is an adapted uh, figure from the Homer software <coughs> And what it's portraying is the number of high C reads that you sequence that support a three-dimensional interaction and the linear distance between those pieces in the genome. So what that means is when two contigs are very close together over here, you will see many high C reads between those two contigs. And when two contigs are very far apart, you'll really see uh, very few high C reads that's that support them. And what that allows you to do is just sort of make the uh, assumption that uh, contigs that are close in linear sequence proximity tend to be close in three-dimensional proximity. So let's say that in the high C sequencing, you observe three high C reads that provide a link between this contig here and this contig here. Perhaps that's many, and that um, would be found somewhere up here. And you would assume that those are close in linear sequence because there's many high C reads between those two contigs. On the other hand, if you only have two between these two contigs or one between these two contigs, those would be found somewhere down here. And you would infer the linear distance based on the number of reads between those two contigs. 
when you do this iteratively, um, informatically, you can order and orient the contigs uh, along the chromosome in, into the correct order and, and produce a more accurate uh, scaffold within a, within a chromosome. Now, while the applications of the HiC data have been incredibly, incredibly valuable over time um, in genome assembly and in chromatin confirmation, really only a very few amount of labs have been able to uh, perform the HiC protocol and analysis uh, su successfully. And um, historically, the methods have been faced uh, by lots of challenges. Uh, the first challenge of which is these HiC uh, methods before us tend to require millions of cells as, as input, which is a little bit restrictive to lots of different sample types. Um, they have had cumbersome uh, semi-quantitative or non-comprehensive QC checkpoints, whether that be gels or um, you know, uh, detecting the interaction frequency between only two uh, loci in the genome using, using PCR. The protocols have been historically very long, at least three to four days, sometimes up to a full week. And in some cases, uh, suboptimal signal-to-noise ratios and experimental reproducibility. And um, regarding sequencing, um, their requirement for often billions of reads for certain applications. So with some of those technical and um, economic challenges in mind, we really set out to develop um, a high C workflow to solve a lot of those, of those problems. So now I'm going to shift gears to talking specifically about the ARIMA high C workflow, um, whereas before I was just talking about high C in general. Um, so with respect to ARIMA high C, I'm going to talk um, very specifically about the flexible sample input requirements um, to the ARIMA high C kit, the six hour uh, ARIMA high C workflow, and the pre-validated library, library prep options that we have. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about our our built-in quality control, and our recommendations for Illumina sequencing. For sample input requirements, um, the sample sources that we're often working with would be human and mouse, and we have uh, uh, validated protocols for these other vertebrates, invertebrates, insects, plants, and um, others. The sample types uh, for the uh, ARIMA HiC protocols would be cultured or primary cells, fact sorted cells or nuclei if you're trying to sort out a specific subpopulation, whole blood and fresh or frozen tissues. In terms of the sample amounts, this is, this is a really important thing. The standard amount of uh, sample materials here are listed below. So for mammalian cells, a typical arima high c reaction is going to use about 500,000 to, to a million cells. We're usually starting with somewhere around 50 or so milligrams of frozen animal tissue. In terms of insects, about 5 to 10 mosquitoes, um, a couple mils of mammalian blood, and about 50 microliters or so of nucleated blood, and somewhere around 125 to 250 milligrams of plant tissue. I said that these were the standard amounts. Um, we're very excited to have just um, released our low input protocols, which are designed to handle much less uh, sample input than this, somewhere um, in the range of about a log order less than what we were um, working with in our standard protocols. So that's less than 100,000 mammalian cells or somewhere in the range of about 50 to 100 nanograms of total DNA that you can extract from these. Um, and we're really excited about the, the new sample types that this will unlock. So switching gears back to the ARIMA HiC protocol, um, conceptually, the protocol is uh, similar to other HiC protocols in that it is a proximity ligation-based method to measure the 3D genome, but in practice, it's very, very different. The entire uh, biochemistry of HiC has been completely revamped and a completely different workflow than uh, uh, prior methods. Um, as an example of that, you can see here that during the digestion step, we've, we've innovated to use a cocktail of restriction enzymes to increase the coverage and uniformity of the genome that you detect by, by HiC. And I, I, I wanna take just, just a closer look so you can actually see what you get. 
um, when it comes to uh, the ARIMA high c kit. So this is a breakdown of the workflow. You begin with a cross-link sample that is resuspended in just 20 microliters of lysis buffer. There are two consecutive incubations with uh, buffers. That is followed by three consecutive incubations with enzymes. You can see our enzyme cocktail um, is here for the digestion, uh, fill-in, and then ligation. You end with reversing the crosslinks that you that you induced in the beginning, and purifying the DNA uh, using uh, ampere beads. So in total, we're looking at about eight steps. It's a single tube uh, chemistry from the very beginning through, through the end. So there's no uh, tube changes, spins, freezing, or anything like that. Um, you're looking at about four and a half hours of, of incubation time, really, and about an hour of hands-on time, and a, a total volume of about 300 microliters if, if you're interested in scaling up into uh, PCR plates. So our approach to library prep, um, our our philosophy here is that we haven't been um, reinventing the wheel of library prep. We know that there's a lot of really great commercial library prep kits out there that have you know, sunk a lot of time into R&D to make the best library prep um, kits. And what we do is we will provide protocols so that you can take advantage of those kits like the Kappa Hyper Prep Kit. So you would follow the ARIMA library prep protocol, but you would ultimately use the reagents from Kappa Hyper Prep uh, Swift, NEB, or Illumina, for example. In terms of QC, the, there are three QC checkpoints, the first of which is right here before you really even get started into high c it's after, after cross-linking. Um, there's another checkpoint after you finish high c kind of a halfway checkpoint, and then one right before PCR. In this pre-high-C QC checkpoint, the purpose of this is just to optimize your sample input that goes into the ARIMA high-C reaction. So, so what you're going to do is you're just going to take a small aliquot of that sample, purify the DNA from that using the reagents in the kit. You take that amount of DNA that you obtained from a small aliquot and you use that to infer how much sample should be put into the ARIMA high-C reaction. This Second QC checkpoint, we call this ARIMA QC1. The purpose of this is to determine the efficiency of ARIMA high C. What you're actually going to be doing is quantifying the percentage of DNA here that is labeled with biotin. You're going to plug this number into the ARIMA QC worksheet, and that's ultimately going to give you a pass or fail value. And that pass or fail value actually is derived from a lot of the legwork we've done to make this a predictive QC checkpoint. So what's important here is, depending on your ARIMA QC1 value, if it's above a certain number, that tends to correlate with a cluster of, of libraries that we have generated in-house in that were successful. And if it's below a certain number, that tends to be predictive of a library that was not successful. So the QC is predictive of success. The, the final pre-sequencing QC checkpoint is this ARIMA QC2, and it determines the overall efficiency of the ARIMA high C workflow, and it tells you the optimal number of PCR cycles that you should use. All you're going to do is put your ARIMA high C library into the Kappa library quant um, assay, plug those numbers into the ARIMA QC worksheet, and same thing, you will get a pass or fail value that is backed up by uh, several libraries that would help you predict the success. In terms of sequencing, uh, this is sort of a general recommendation guideline. Um, of course, all the sequencing is going to be in paired end mode. And if your analysis goal is uh, defining compartment A and B, which didn't have much uh, time to talk about today, you're really looking at a very shallow number of reads, maybe 50 million or less. Um, when you're defining topological domains, some of those um, Megabase size structures, we're generally recommending about 300 million read pairs. For those high resolution structures, um, we're recommending about 600 million uh, loops, which I will talk about later. And remember, these are the loops that are useful for defining um, gene uh, regulatory mechanisms, like I showed um, in the very beginning. And for genome scaffolding, it depends a lot on the quality of the uh, uh, draft assembly and the uh, genome size, but generally for a three, three gigabase genome, we're somewhere around 150 to 600 million read pairs. 
So shifting focus here to data analysis tools. Um, I'm going to talk about our philosophy and some of the tools available for chromatin confirmation and genome scaffolding and how to visualize uh, those uh, data. So our philosophy here is that we fully support uh, several excellent open source data analysis tools. It's really our goal to get those open source tools working in your hands. Um, so when you uh, get an ARIMA High C kit, what that comes with is a very hands-on uh, uh, tech support ecosystem that will help you install these tools and implement these open source tools correctly. Um, we will help you interpret the uh, data quality that you get from running these tools, and we will even um, analyze a subsample of your data, run it through our uh, QC pipeline or a pipeline of your choice, and uh, send you our interpretation. So the general workflow here for data analysis is whether you're doing genome assembly or genome uh, confirmation analysis, you're going to begin with mapping, uh, filtering, and quality control of the ARIMA high c data. Now, if you're going to go the genome scaffolding path, uh, that will be done with uh, tools such as SALSA. And if you're going to go down the path of feature annotation, which is defining compartments, tabs, and loops, that'll go down another path, uh, such as using the juicer tool uh, developed by the Aiden Lab. And ultimately, you're going to want to visualize the output of both of those. And um, you can visualize both of those using tools uh, such as Juicebox, um, also developed by the Aiden Lab. So here's an example of how to visualize those data. Um, high c data is typically presented in a uh, symmetrical matrix, and I want to just sort of unpack what we're looking at uh, here. So the first thing that you'll see is that the chromosomes or contigs are ordered across the x-axis and they're ordered across the y-axis. So it's a symmetrical matrix. The other thing that you might be wondering is what is the uh, red signal? And the red signal here represents the number of high C reads that support a particular three-dimensional interaction. So for example, when you sequence a molecule back in the example I had in the beginning, and let's say this sequence is derived from chromosome one and this was derived from chromosome four, the way that that would be plotted is you would find chromosome four and chromosome one, and that one high C read would be plotted as a single uh, data point in this box. And if this was chromosome four and chromosome four, you'd find chromosome four here and here, and that would end up as a data point in this box. The other thing that you'll see here is that the high C signal is predominantly intrachromosomal. And actually that's expected if you remember back to the concept of, of chromosome territories, because lots of the high C signal that gets captured um, is intrachromosomal because that's just a reflection of how the genomes are organized um, based, on, based on microscopy. So that makes sense. And then, you know, as you would expect, there's a very low interchromosomal signal. There's a very low uh, you know, number of high C reads between chromosome 1 and 12, for example, because in the actual uh, nucleus, those chromosomes often do not abut each other. So let's take a closer look. What we're going to do here is zoom in on a very small, let's say about a one megabase region on chromosome 2, and let's see what that looks like. So this is a plot that is um, supposed to illustrate the, the concept of how high c detects uh, loops and what that loop signal looks like in the high c matrix. So to help illustrate that, let's, let's lay a yellow, a green, a blue, and a gray dot along the genome. And what that would look like represented is something like this. Now, what what is the high C data showing at this particular locus? Well, in fact, it's showing this. And what you see here in the cartoon is that yellow and green have sort of pinched together and formed this loop structure. And now yellow and green are very close in three-dimensional space, right? So that interaction, if you will, between yellow and green is captured here. If you trace the green signal up to where it intersects the yellow, that's when you see that um, abundance or enrichment of high C reads supporting that loop. The same thing can be said for the, 
the gray and the blue, which are very close in three-dimensional space here, whereas the blue and the green are close in three-dimensional in three, three space, but they're not pinched together. They haven't formed that loop. So you see an increase in interactions here in this, in this domain, but not that really um, intense uh, signal enrichment that would be indicative of a loop. And again, being able to define these features is really the uh, starting point to help understand the regulatory and structural framework for which uh, gene regulation occurs. So uh, the final uh, section here is going to be on um, a couple stories about the performance of the ARIMA um, HiC data to detect more chromatin loops with less sequencing effort, as well as to generate chromosome scale and accurate genome assemblies. So starting first with uh, chromatin confirmation, in order to help explain the performance of the ARIMA HiC data, it's helpful to benchmark it against uh, existing sort of prior so-called state-of-the-art high-resolution high seat data uh, from the literature using a very well characterized human cell line. And from the previously published high seat data, what I'm going to show you here is a is, is a loop plot from about 3.6 billion high seat reads and about a 1.8 billion processed high seat reads, if you will. And that'll look something like this, which is very similar to the plot I previously showed you where you see the presence of a loop here. And from about this many total reads, you're detecting about 74 high c reads that support that particular loop call. Now, what does this look like in ARIMA high c data? We sequenced um, ARIMA high c to about a third of the total number of raw reads, about 1.2 billion. And um, you see that there's 96 uh, reads that support this, this particular loop call, despite having a third as many total reads. And uh, this is just a really a case in point example where ARIMA high c detects the chromatin loop at a greater signal strength, despite having less than half the uh, depth. So how does this sort of translate on a, on a genome-wide scale? Well, one of the things that we did was we asked how many of the previously published high c loops, there's about 9,000 about 9, 9, of them, does the ARIMA high c data call? It's about 80%. However, the ARIMA high c data calls an additional 9,000 or so unique loops that were previously not called in the uh, published data. Um, and we were really interested by this sort of observation that with far less sequencing, you could still detect the same loops that were found in the, in the previous data, plus many novel loops. So we downsampled the data from about 1.2 billion raw reads down to 1 billion raw reads, all the way down to 600 million raw reads. And the high C signal plot looks very, very, very similar. Um, and then we asked, uh, well, how many total loops are we calling in this downsampled data? And even with only 600 million reads, we're still calling about 12,000 or 13,000 loops where the published data was only able to identify about 8,000 or so. And this was really nice. This was all you know, data generated in, in our hands. Um, and one of our, our early access customers uh, did the same same sort of process on a human fiberbreast cell line and found the same thing in this case with only 600 million reads able to identify about 3,000 more loops than the published uh, data from from more sequencing. So this is really a unique advantage and a benefit of high, of ARIMA high c is being able to, to detect more loops with less uh, sequencing effort. Switching gears again to the uh, genome assembly um, application this is um, an example pipeline for the data analysis. Um, in this particular case, um, we took um, in, uh, in collaboration with Adam Philippi and, and uh, Jay Geyer's group, um, uh, contigs from Oxford Nanopore. We aligned those ARIMA high C data to those, to those contigs, and you feed that in to uh, the SALSA uh, scaffolding algorithm. <coughs> And the way that that works is that iterates and it scaffolds and does iterative uh, error correction until it finally um, cannot improve the scaffold anymore. And with each iteration, it dumps out a scaffolded assembly that you can use to visualize and um, sort of see the improvement in the assembly through each iteration. 
And an, an example of that would be here, where uh, in this particular human assembly, um, the uh, nanopore N50 was about 4.8 uh, megabases. And when you align the HiC data to that, of course, you see lots of signal in the intercontig space um, because uh, this particular red signal here would mean that um, the, the contig here and the contig here along the genome should probably be merged together and are part of the same chromosome. And after the third iteration, you can see that lots of those contigs have now been clustered into chromosomes, like I said before, until you get to the uh, final iteration where you see a very contiguous uh, assembly with an N50 of about 138 megabases. <laughs> The uh, human reference genome N50 is about 156 megabases. And in the paper, uh, you would see that the N50 adjusted for genome size is about 125 megabases. That can be portrayed like this, uh, where this is a chromosome ideogram of the human genome. And every sort of switch between colors represents some sort of um, a assembly error in the um, input uh, Oxford nanopore, and then after it goes through that scaffolding process, you see um, um, you know, much less errors. Certain, certain chromosomes, like uh, chromosome four, are error-free. And uh, again, an N50 of about 138 megabases. Uh, the ARIMA HiC uh, technology is also part of the vertebrate genome project phase one, and this is the pipeline for assembly in, in phase one. You begin with uh, PacBio long reads to build your contigs. There's two rounds of scaffolding from 10x and um, bio nano maps, and then HiC comes in here at the at the end to do the final scaffold, and um, that's finished off with gap filling, error correction, and then annota annotation using ISOSeq. And just as an example of that, if you align the HiC data to the hummingbird, which was uh, one of the samples um, that was just uh, released by the VGP. Um, it would look something like this, as you would expect. Um, this had an N50 of only about 3.5 megabases. Again, this is just aligning the HiC data to the contigs. Um, so this is what you would expect. And after it goes through that entire VGP assembly pipeline, when you realign the HiC data to the final assembly, it looks something like this, very, very clean. Um, an accurate assembly with a N50 of 74 megabases. And you know, one of the really unique things about HiC is you can use the data to scaffold the genome, anchor it to chromosomes, and build that, that genome assembly. And you can go back and reuse the same HiC data to undercover the underlying biology of that genome. So what I'm going to zoom in on here is just a tiny little region from the, sur from the first uh, pseudo chromosome and try to detect uh, loops. And in fact, you see the presence of loops. In fact, there's about 10 detected just in this uh, two megabase locus. Uh, and it looks very similar to what it would on, on the human genome. And in fact, you can detect about 2,500 loops um, in this particular sample uh, from just a couple lanes of sequencing. The last piece is, uh, I'm just gonna quickly go over adapting the Rima HiC for a couple targeted genome confirmation assays. The first of which is a technology called Capture HiC, and I'm just gonna go through this uh, quickly. You begin with HiC, and a Rima HiC can be plugged uh, into this. This is the typical HiC workflow. The only unique difference here is that you can introduce a target enrichment step right here before sequencing. What that allows you to do is pull out the sequences of interest from the final HiC library so you can detect the three-dimensional genome only for a subset of loci throughout the genome. And that is really useful if you only are interested in detecting the three-dimensional structure of promoters or enhancers or disease-associated loci or specific topological domains and uh, whatever you would like. If you send us a list of the genes that you're interested in or the regions, we can help you with, with the design and share a design file to enable you to order those um, uh, target, target enrichment probes. The other uh, interesting case is that we have found that our, our customers have wanted to plug uh, uh, you know, HiC uh, into another uh, technology that's called high chip or, or uh, plaque seek and what we have found that our customers are are doing is is this workflow here where you introduce chip after the high C part 
and that allows you to detect genomic interactions that are mediated by a specific protein of interest. Really interesting uh, uh, case. So in summary, uh, HiC technology captures DNA sequence and DNA structure for applications in epigenetics and genome assembly research. Uh, HiC adoption, though, has been generally limited due to a lot of the technical challenges and economic challenges that I that I introduced uh, with regard to sample prep and sequencing. And Arima HiC really <coughs> aims to solve those technical and economic challenges um, by providing accurate and reproducible results at a reduced sequencing depth, ensure, uh, ensuring that the HiC sequencing is successful via quick, easy, and predictive QC checkpoints a very fast and user-friendly workflow, and very flexible sample input requirements. So that, I would just like to thank you all for uh, listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you, Anthony. And if you do have questions, please enter it into the Q&A box below. I do have a couple of questions already, and feel free to answer them as we, or ask your own questions as we go along. Uh, first one is a pretty good question. Uh, how does the loop signal improve with fewer reads using the ARIMA protocol? Um, Anthony, could you dive into a couple of the chemistry reasons why you actually see improved loop signal and data quality with uh, less reads? Yeah, sure. Uh, we think it's a couple things. Um, the multi-enzyme uh, chemistry, what that does is it, it allows you to have more uh, data points around the genome. And um, because you have more cut sites uh, around the genome, you're, you're likely to have more cut sites that are close to uh, loop, loop anchors. And when you have more, more data points that are by loops, it allows you to sort of enrich for that signal um, compared to methods where there's only maybe one enzyme. The second thing is that the uh, efficiency of the, of the protocol allows you to detect more long range interactions. Um, those are the interactions that ultimately get fed into loop, uh, loop calling. So those, those long range intrachromosomal interactions is what enables you to detect loops, uh, not short contiguous pieces of DNA or not interchromosomal interactions. So being able to enrich for the, for the capture of that long range information um, is ultimately what, what would enable you to, um, to detect more. Great, thank you, Anthony. I'm getting a couple of questions about uh, data analysis, uh, specifically for genome confirmation. Could you dive into some of the tools that are available uh, that we are supporting for genome confirmation analysis? So for genome confirmation analysis, the open source tools that, that we support right now um, is Juicer. Um, there is another tool called HiC Pro. Uh, there's another one called High Cup uh, from the Babraham Institute. Actually, High Cup um, just had a request, I think, from one of our early access customers, and they have since released um, an updated version of, of High Cup that allows you to analyze the multi enzyme Arima HiC chemistry. So, so though, now that is easy to support. Um, I think a couple other ones would be High C Bench. Um, from NYU and Homer, which was developed at UCSD. Um, when it comes to feature annotation that I talked about, um, we have the most experience using Juicer, which is a really nice tool because all in one, it sort of allows you to detect the compartment AB patterns, um, topological domains, and uh, loops. And for visualization, I think I mentioned that um, all the plots that you saw here were, were made using the juice box tool from the Aiden lab. Um, I know that there's a couple other nice tools out there like, like high glass. And um, I think high seat bench also has a, has a visualization feature um, that, that in theory you, you could use. So there's a lot of really nice tools out there. We are familiar running all of them and, and uh, happy to support any of them. Okay. Thanks, and getting a lot of great questions, everyone. Keep them coming. Um, I'm going to try to put a few together uh, that I've gotten. So can you explain a little bit more about the, the actual experimental setup a person would have? We've been getting a lot of questions about uh, formaldehyde um, percentages and cross-linking within cells or tissue, and also um, how people set up duplicates, replicates, et cetera. 
Yeah, sure. So when it comes to cross-linking, um, we, we did some experiments um, where we varied the cross-linking strength using formaldehyde, as well as the cross-linking duration for tissues and cell lines. And we tried to find um, that optimal cross-linking strength and duration that maximized um, the proportion of long-range uh, data while minimizing the noise. Um, the amount of cross-linking time that we have uh, optimized for is about 10 minutes using 2% formaldehyde um, for cell lines. And for tissues, it's 2% for 20 minutes. Um, cells are just cross-linked um, as they are, whether you're whether you've uh, sorted them or you're growing them in culture. For tissues, however, tissues are first pulverized into a, into a powder um, and then cross-linked using our uh, cross-linking protocols. Um, our user guides have the full, full cross-linking workflow in them. Um, when it comes to the experimental setup, uh, the way that uh, you know, we like to um, you know, do this is when you first receive a Rima High C kit, um, you will uh, be offered a uh, kickoff call with our tech support um, to really provide uh, sort of two options. One, to go through all the protocols in detail and ask any of the questions you have about the workflow, but also to, I think, bounce your ideas re regarding experimental design off of us. What we generally recommend for first time users is to um, uh, just you know, run you know one or two samples. Uh, ideally, run them in replicate. Um, having the replicates ultimately allows you to determine the reproducibility of the workflow and the reproducibility of the data. Um, if those two pilot reactions go go good, you can ultimately you know sequence them sequence them uh, deeply and merge the replicate data for for analysis. Uh, or you can then um, after you've confirmed that it's working in your hands, then you can expand to other sample types. So I, I hope that answers that, that question. Okay, thank you. And uh, just to add another point onto that, because I've gotten a couple of questions, the uh, protocol that we use is uh, cross-linked in cell or in nuclei. So it'd be very similar to uh, what people consider in situ high C in the past. It's the same sort of protocol. And I will also add, if you do have any questions about a specific project in terms of uh, pricing or how many samples you'd like to run, uh, please reach out to us directly. We'd like to answer those questions one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, we'll be sending out an email following this protocol or following the presentation. Um, another good question, what is the fragment size range that you obtain with the ARIMA multi-enzyme cutting strategy? Yeah, sure. If you were to digest the uh, the chromatin um, and then reverse the crosslinks directly after di after digestion, uh, you can run that on a tape station or bioanalyzer. Um, and what we tend to see is that the average fragment size is usually centered somewhere around 800 base pairs up to about 1.2 kb, with of course tails going down to um, about 400 base pairs and then also a little bit uh, north of 1.2 kb, maybe up to about two and a half or three kb. Um, it, it, it can vary a little bit, you know, cell type to cell type, but um, generally speaking, that's what, that's what we typically see. Great, thanks. Um, I have a question on uh, capture high C and how capture high C would work in regards to uh, the REMA protocol. Yeah, um, so f really the REMA protocol is uh, no, no different. Um, you start with the same number of cells as you normally would for uh, a standard ARIMA high C reaction. You go through the high C protocol that I described. You also go through the library prep protocol that I described. Um, so end repair, A tailing, uh, PCR amplification. The only difference is for capture high C right after PCR amplification, that's when you would do a target enrichment uh, method to enrich your high C library for specific genomic regions. So the overall high C workflow will feel very, very similar, except before sequencing, you've now inserted a target enrichment, which is really just an overnight capture and uh, purification PCR and sequencing. Great, thank you. 
And yeah, we'll be sticking around for the next five minutes or so. So keep on uh, answer, asking questions if you'd like. And uh, with that, I'm going to ask a uh, sort of tricky one that is uh, hard to explain verbally, but I'll let Anthony give his best shot. Um, how would you explain uh, N50? So N50 is um, the uh, length of the genome where, where uh, half of the genomic sequence is represented uh, by the uh, contig. So it's, it's the length of um, the, it's really the contig length um, that is half of the total uh, uh, genome length. So um, in the case of uh, five megabases, that means that half of the contigs um, were more than that and half of them were less than that relative to the length of the genome, of the, of the genome, sorry. Great, thank you. Just looking through the questions right now. Oh, does the, does the kit work on uh, sorted nuclei? Yes, it does. Um, yeah, we've had some early access uh, customers who, who have been able to make uh, successful libraries using sorted nuclei. Great. And got a couple more left. And I've been getting a couple of questions about uh, genome assembly data analysis. Could you walk through the, the actual tools you would use to actually go from high seed mapping to um, plugging into Salsa, the, fuel, the full set of tools uh, one might use to um, use high seed to assemble chromosomes? So for the genome assembly, uh, what, we, what we like to recommend is that um, ARIMA High C, uh, we have our own mapping pipeline on uh, GitHub. And that uses BWA mem to align the high C reads to the contigs. Um, we have some custom scripts to filter uh, the alignments um, to make sure that uh, only the informative and high quality alignments are, are retained. Um, after that, you would use um, Picard tools to remove PCR duplicates, and then you would ultimately con convert those alignments into uh, what's, what's called the bed file. Um, that really uh, represents uh, the links, uh, the, the, the high C reads that link one contact to another. That particular file is then fed into the uh, Salsa tool. And uh, the Salsa tool is the one that ultimately um, tries to anchor the contigs into chromosomes and order them and orient them and detect errors after each after each iteration, uh, misjoin errors. And uh, the Salsa tool will output a FASTA file after each iteration uh, until it, it reaches a final assembly. And the way that it de determines that it's done is uh, when um, after each iteration, if it can detect that it's only producing more errors, that's sort of how it knows when it's done. And uh, then you, you, you produce your final assembly. What, what, what we have done to uh, visualize the data is we've taken the ARIMA high c data and then we align it back to the output of Salsa after each iteration. And then we can visualize uh, that using uh, Juicebox. Great, thank you. And uh, we do have a lot of questions I don't think we'll have time to. Uh, we will try to follow up uh, via email afterwards if you uh, have your name on these questions. And again, please feel free to reach out as well. Uh, but I, I'm just gonna close with two more questions. Um, one would be in terms of uh, resolution of high c And this has been something that's been exciting while people have been moving into Capture high c and HiChip uh, to improve their resolution. But uh, we did have the question of why someone would do high chip or high C in terms of the resolution that you might get? I, I guess I'll take the capture high C um, as an example. Um, I think that the concept uh, here is that uh, typically um, with, with high C, because you're sequencing the, in the entire genome, um, the relative amount of signal that you get between each possible bin pair um, is relatively uh, limited because you're sequencing the entire genome. If you're interested in um, only the uh, promoters, for example, you can enrich 
for just those promoters, let's say that's only about 1% of the genome, and that helps you significantly drive down the uh, cost of sequencing because you'll have to do much less because you're only sequencing a, a fraction of the genome. In terms of the resolution, uh, HiC data is typically um, what's called binned, um, and uh, uh, typical, you know, high C, even uh, high resolution high C data will be binned into something like five uh, uh, kilobase bins. But with capture high C, you're able to um, have uh, much um, higher resolution data. I think in our, in our particular design, um, you actually analyze the data with respect to the restriction fragments. Um, so in our design, the resolution is, I think, on average, about 500 base pairs um, because we merge three restriction fragments together, um, which is about tenfold uh, higher resolution than the, than the typical 5 KB bin size. Thanks, Anthony. And we're at time. So with that, we're going to conclude this presentation. Thank you so much, everyone, for your attendance and great questions. Again, if you have anything you'd like to talk about specifically, just reach out to myself, Jay, or via arimagenomics.com. Have a great day, everyone.